participation series, but um, for those of you who don't know, yesterday Jayla turned two, and so we are going to have a uh, short uh, birthday party here at the church that you are all welcome to. No gifts are needed. you're free and you're able to, we'd love for you to come and join us uh, tonight and celebrate uh, that. And then Jonathan is in Vegas, but he should be back for a Thursday uh, Bible study. He might be a little bit winded, uh, but he's planning on being here. And so we will look forward to that. For those of you who are coming out on Thursday night, uh, Jonathan is uh, facilitating a Thursday night theology studies that have been very profitable as we look a little bit deeper than I tend to go on Sundays, which is a good thing. Um, that's not a bad thing at all. Uh, it's good for us to dive deep into doctrine to know what we believe and, and what the Bible teaches. Uh, when we are doing it on Sunday mornings or even Tuesday studies, uh, normally we're looking more at broad truth. And so it's helpful sometimes to take that stroke and, and go a little bit deeper. Today we are looking at 1 Corinthians 12, and last week we looked at uh, the first few verses there, up to verse 11, looking at uh, Paul kind of wrapped up where the origin of gifts comes from, which is from God, and also their purpose. Why do we have gifts in the first place? And he's going to continue uh, the rest of this chapter, the rest of his thought here by really talking about the harmony of how are these spiritual gifts supposed to work together. And we talked about the fact that you're supposed to obey God regardless whether you know what uh, spiritual gifts he's given you or not. And we talked about how uh, one gift is not over the other. There's not one that should be more prized or vaunted uh, over others. And so let's look here at verse 12 through the end of the chapter very quickly. I will read through this as Paul makes this case uh, for how these gifts are to work together in unity. Verse 12 of chapter 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. The foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the, whole if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow great honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. That there should be no schism in the body, that the members should have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. For you are the body of Christ and members individually. God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing and helps, administrations, and variety of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. Yet I show you a more excellent way. Because 
dive into that. Well, they're afraid that you'd help us to grasp the principle that Paul is trying to drive home for us. We might be able to apply it within our body of believers here this morning for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the lessons that I find we teach to the children a lot, and one that you and I probably learned as kids, but we keep learning it as adults, is to think of others besides yourself. We just brought home a little puppy yesterday, and uh, similar with bringing home Micah, that lesson is taught multiple times a day. You need to think of others besides yourself. It's, it's not just about what you want, and this, this applies whether we're at Thanksgiving and you're trying to figure out who gets the last piece of pie, um, whether it's finishing up pizza, and the kids need to split the last piece. It's taking turns with the toys. Um, Jayla got a makeup kit, a fake makeup kit for her birthday. And Silas, I think, has played with it more than she has. Um, you know, sharing turns. Uh, as adults, it turns into other things, right? Paying for others' meals. Uh, giving away loved belongings to those who have need. Uh, all of these start at the that we teach to children. For some of us, it's a lifelong lesson that we have to keep learning over and over and over again. Uh, Sarah and I both laugh about this still, that Silas and Jayla both learned mine as one of their first words. Not because I told them. Uh, that is something you come out of the womb saying, right? This is mine. You can't take it. This, you, no, no, this is mine. Uh, whether it's taking it from a sibling or uh, Jayla is telling her Cassie that she loves it, uh, we don't have to teach them to be selfish. We actually have to teach them to care about others and, and to share with others and to think about what they need throughout the day. We similarly see this with the Corinthian church. As they interact with each other and they're using their gifts um, we, we see that they are basically saying the same kind of thing. Well, my gift's better than yours, and I have the spotlight now, and it's all about me and what I get to do in the church. So Paul is reminding them that, yes, there is a diversity of gifts, but we need to have unity. And that's why we see this uh, illustration that he uses. Of there's one body, but there's many parts that are functioning together. And he's trying to illustrate that unification in the church that we have in Christ. There's many but one. While we are many that, that have difference in ethnicity, we have socioeconomic statuses that are different, right? So that there are all sorts of separations that we can look at that make us different, whether it's our age, our background, where we grew up even in the country. Right? I mean, somebody who grew up on the East Coast has a very different mindset and worldview than somebody who grew up in the Midwest. Um, all these things are things that in the society around us divide us and make us different and establish individuality and really can make us separated from each other. But those things aren't supposed to be in the church. The church is supposed to be typified by unity through the diversity, right? That as we recognize our diversity of gifts, as we recognize the diversity of people that God's brought together in a body of believers, that that's actually our strength, that's not our weakness. That having a diverse, different group of people that have come together is actually needed and vital to the health of this church, to the health of every church. We need to have differences. We can't all be like Bob and Katie. I'm sorry, but that's just, it, it wouldn't work. Right? We, we can't all be like, like Bernadine. We can't all be that way. We can't all be like Elmi. We, we, there's got to be differences. We can't have the same kind of lives. We can't have the, the same 
the same house. We can't have the same enjoyments and, and things. But that's also that's also who we like to hang out with. Is people that share the same interests as we do, and, and share the same same kinds of purpose and goals and jobs and, and other things in life. So over and over we see that the church is supposed to be really opposite of how the world naturally works together. Uh, the church is supposed to be that one safe place in the midst of a broken world where everyone comes together and we're all worshiping God and living in the grace of he provides the community of people who treat each other and live in a way that demonstrates the love that God has for us. And we are then channeling that to one another. We saw this as we looked at Psalm 133 this morning uh, with that last verse. It's, it's a really cool illustration that the psalmist uses. The unity is like the Dew of Hermon descending on the Mount of Zion. Mountains of Zion. How how does dew descend on the mountains of Zion? Like that that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I was working this week and walking through grass that had dew on it, and my shoes get wet, but that's about it. Like there's not really a whole lot of power there. And these dew drops are all individual and they're separated. How in the world are they supposed to be descending on the mountain if they're all scattered across an area? Well, the dew comes together in a trickle, right? Uh, as, as there's an amount of water that's coming together, eventually it becomes a trickle and then creek or crick, depending on where you grew up. And then it becomes a stream and then it becomes a river. And then all of a sudden you have a mighty river crashing over a cliff creating a beautiful waterfall that is powerful, moving all in one direction. All the dew has unified, going the same direction, right? That's the idea. That we're to care about each other without allowing the human constructs of our world to hinder us. So look at how he uses this with the body. We have many members, but we're all one in Christ. We all have the same spirit. We're all baptized in the same body. It doesn't matter what our difference is in verse 13, whether we're Jews or Greeks or slave or free. We're, we're all in the same spirit. We're, we're all in the same group. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. We should totally be recognizing that and be okay with that. But then using this illustration of the human body, we're not to say that I don't need certain people. They need to be more like me. Right? That's the idea that we're seeing here that Paul is, is point, pointing out. Believers see everyone as image bearers of God. and We're not saying that they need to be more like me. No, you need to be more like Christ. Because at the end of the day, we're all sinners that actually need salvation and, and then after that, we're all believers that are part of the same church in the same spiritual condition. We all need to grow in sanctification and become more like Christ and less like ourselves. So there's no room in the body of Christ for anyone thinking that they would be superior or that there is there's some sort of bettering that I'm better than Jack because I have gifts or social abilities that he doesn't. J.C. Ryle puts it this way, beware of division. One of the things that the children of the world can always understand, if they don't understand doctrine, that thing is angry, quarreling, and controversy. So be at peace with our children, right? And if there's to be one place where we can come together and actually leave rejoicing and unified and encouraged, and, and growing together, it would be the church. We're not, we're not looking at others and saying, as the foot says in verse 15, well, because I'm not the hand, clearly I'm not important. I don't need to be part of the body. Right? I'll just go off and do my own thing. Or the ear says to the eye, well, 
I'm, I'm not the I, so therefore I don't need to be part of the body. I'm not essential here. I'm not necessary. I can go do what I want because the body will thrive without me. But we suffer losing any part of the body, right? Uh, whether it's the ears or the nose, the mouth, the eyes, all of those things are necessary. Right? If the whole body in verse 17 were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if, if it was hearing, where would be the smelling? You take your tongue out. Where, how can you taste? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased with his will. So we're brought back to who gives the gift. From a secular standpoint, it would be easy to look at the church and see some of the members as more valuable than others. That's what you do in companies. <laughs> you have a priority of who's more important than others. And some people are fired because their value to the company is no longer needed, right? Others are promoted because they're seen as more valuable. And we could easily look around the church and say, well, there's some people in the church that are more necessary than others. where he's got, he is pointing us back to know God has set each one just as he pleased. Notice, too, how he points down, uh, he says in verse 22, that there are members in the body that seem weaker. They're still necessary. Verse 23, those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on those we bestow greater honor. We're, we're giving honor to the ones with little honor and respecting those who are unrespectable, right? That's the idea here. Instead of giving honor to those that already have honor, already th we think deserve honor, right? Because we're basing that on what we see. Uh, continuing in this analogy of uh, the body that Paul's using here. I used to think about this as I was learning piano. Um, when you're playing piano, depending on how advanced there are parts of your body you're still not using, right? So I, I decided that I could lose my right leg because that's what uses the pedal. But I could lose my left leg. Like, I could get along. If I had to lose part of my body, I could get along without my left leg. And then you get farther into piano music and realize, well, there's three pedals for a reason at the bottom of the piano, and you need both your feet. But then I decided I can't lose anything, right? I need it all. I can't lose my hands because that's too hard. And I, I couldn't just pedal with one foot. And then when I got to camp as a middle schooler, around this, this was a year. This was not a couple months. This was like years long. Internal debate of like, what would I be willing to lose on my body? Uh, we had a missionary uh, that was to Papua New Guinea. And she was a nurse there, and she was on furlough, and so she was nurse. She was the nurse at camp that week, and she shared her testimony in one of the uh, mornings during chapel, which was really cool. She went into way more detail than I'm going to go into today, but the short version of it was kids mow with shoes on, uh, because when she was mowing as a little kid uh, with the push mower, she lost her two big toes the mower. And um, I didn't really think about it until she started talking about how hard it is to walk without your big toes, both of them. And then she talked about how after she got out of medical school, she believed God was leading her to be a missionary in Papua New Guinea, which is an island of nothing but mountains. And you need your big toes to climb and hike and walk very essential uh, to all of them. And so he said she remembers the first time that she tried to start hiking. She fell over a lot. She said, and my dependence on God became very radical right away. That if I don't have God helping me, I'm not going to be able to obey what he wants me to do. It was a really, really simple lesson in every part of the body is essential for you to be able to function. It's, 
It is necessary. God has designed it all. It's, it's not like you can lose your pinky and get along. Like, yes, but it's not as good as what God had designed. God is the one who builds the church both internationally and locally. And so we see that God brings together these members as he pleases in verse 18. They're not to be considered more necessary or less necessary. And as we look at these, we're actually to be giving honor to the ones that we think, hey, we probably shouldn't actually be honoring that person. No, they're still necessary. God has brought them to be part of, of this body. And so we recognize that each is part of the body by God's appointment. God has put together that body and everyone is equal. Everyone is caring for each other. And so what does that result in? Well, it results in verse 27. You're the body of Christ and members individually. Well, we haven't lost our individuality, so, so how does this work? Well, God's design actually results in there's no division. There's supposed to be unity and harmony going on here. So if one member suffers, then we all suffer together, right? Verse 25 and 26, there's to be no division or schism in the body. The members should all have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer. And if one member is honored, all rejoice with it. That's the idea of how the body works together. We're not rejoicing over one person's gifts and shaming someone else. We're not, you know, why they have to be part of this church over some people and rejoicing that God has brought others. Not everyone is the same. and We have various gifts. God, and even it, when you look at verse 31, and we're to earnestly desire the best gifts. This will point to God actually working in and through our desires, shaping our desires towards what he would have us to do in the church. That's part of all of this, that as we live in obedience to God's word and we seek to be serving others, we find God places us in the perfect position that he wants us to be to channel his grace, his love, to others around us. Right? Look, we are walking the dog last night a little bit. We have walked through our neighborhood probably close to 100 times. We rarely talk to anyone because nobody is just, hi, hey, how are you? All right? We're walking around the corner. We come around the corner. Families coming out of their driveway, they're on the way to the park. We ended up talking for 20 minutes and traded cell phone numbers. We've got life stories already. We just met. And then we go around the corner, go home, get ready for bed. Sarah just looks at me and she said, God never gets the address wrong. God has placed us here for a reason. He's placed you where you are for a reason to be an instrument of God to that neighborhood, to your neighbors. And you're supposed to be doing that. And sometimes it doesn't happen the first week or the first month. We find that God puts us in the perfect position to use us for his glory and others' edification. The goal is not to have a gift that's out front and receiving all the, the recognition. Elizabeth Elliot for happiness through self-assertion. We see this all around us, all the time. That I have to assert myself in order to know my value, my worth, and other people respect me. But the Christian knows that joy is found in self abandonment Jesus said, if a man will let himself be lost for my sake, he'll find that's so true as we think about how our life works, that we are constantly pushed and encouraged to assert yourself, do what you want. And this is why the church is supposed to be so opposite of our world. It's the opposite in that there is not an opportunity for you and I to show off our gifts and our talents and our abilities for our own glory. Our 
ourselves should not be in the picture. Our gifts are not what's supposed to be on display. It's supposed to be how great God is in building his church and bringing together a random group of people that somehow harmoniously work together in unity because we have the same Savior and we're on the same journey. So while you should desire the great greater gifts, as Paul calls them here in verse 31, Paul reminds us that those are still not the complete matter. Your gift is not an end of itself, so how does a diverse group of people with only a common Savior and a spiritual, the same spiritual condition love and put up with one? Because I'm not going to be so simple-minded to think that we all can get along, right? That, that in a group, we're not going to have some individual indiv opinions and some diversity of, of thought on some things. Well, that's part of the leadership of the church. As we look at what do shepherds do in the church, what do pastors do, it helps give direction and encouragement for each individual to help in the ways that they can. And for some, that looks like giving your time. Uh, for others, that means giving resources. For others, that means giving money, right? Uh, for, for all of us, that means using our gifts and our abilities the glory of God and the edification of the body. And all those things by themselves aren't going to be enough, right? We can't just always throw money at a problem and say, hey, we fixed it. We did what we could. Right? And you can give all the time in the world, but you might not have the resources to actually do anything. But all together, the church, with biblical leadership and unification, can be that mighty river that crashes over the a beautiful waterfall. That's the goal of gifts. That's the goal of the unity that we're to see in the church. So what are a couple of the takeaways here? Well, when, when we say that we want to be unified and harmonious as a community of believers, we're not saying that we all need to think the same way. We're not saying that there's no room uh, for individuality, and so we're, we're not trying to look like each other, we're trying to look more like Christ. Uh, but the church also isn't where your individuality is supposed to have a spotlight, right? This isn't the church of Ken, or Jack, or Virgil, or Bob, or Ron. It, it's, it's none of that. It's not about you, or me. Many of us... Uh, actually come from bigger families. So I think this is an easy concept to consider, that you don't get your way all the time. In fact, you don't get it most of the time. Um, you have to take turns. You have to share. And oftentimes, things don't go the way you want it. And that's, that's how the family of God works together. It's how our individual families work together. It's about what's good for the whole family as a body together. Similarly, the community of believers care for each other as a family, helping the weak, caring about the needs of others, sharing the resources available, and sacrificing for the good of the whole family. That really leads to a very convicting question. And are, are you and I doing what we do for God, or are we doing it for ourselves? in God's name, right? That's a really penetrating question. To think about. It, it, am I here for, for God? Am I here to, to edify others and to be obedient to God and his word and, and live for his glory? Or am I actually here because it makes me look good, it makes me feel good, but I'm claiming to do it in God's name? already said this, it's easy to get along with people that we have a lot in common with, but how are you and I stepping into the lives of those we don't get along with, right, uh, that are different from us? How 
are you involved in the lives of your brothers and sisters uh, in the church? Uh, how are you about getting into the lives of your neighbors? Are, are, are you there stepping into their lives, being a representation of Jesus Christ into their world? And demonstrating that there's no partiality, there's no individuality in Christ. He is the answer to our He is the one who gives us that uniting purpose. That a diverse group of people come together around because we all recognize we need the same Savior. We're headed to the same eternal destination. And so while we have different interests and different desires and different things here on earth, ultimately we all have the same eternal path that we're taking. And that unifies us. So how are we doing as a body? Are, are we saying that there's some parts we don't need? Maybe it's that left foot. Maybe it's the right hand. I don't know. But as we look at how we treat each other, uh, I was convicted in my own thinking. It was like, yeah, sometimes it's really easy to be like, yes, I really appreciate this person over this person. And that's not the way that we're supposed to be acting as a church, not the way that we serve one another as a church. So may Paul's admonition here to the Corinthians bring true in our own hearts as well. Father, I pray that you'd help us to do this. It's not easy to get along with those you have differences with, or even struggle to have commonalities with. I pray that you would help us as a group of Typify unity and harmony, that together 